Constants of Nature, the Gods of Modernity What exactly are constants of nature? Remarkably, physics, considered the most exact of all sciences, hasn't a good answer. Are they essential for a rational description of reality? No. Fundamental constants are gods of modernity, but only history makes us understand why it is the job of theoretical physicists to explain them. I cannot imagine a reasonable unified theory containing an explicit number which the whim of the Creator could just as easily have chosen differently. Albert Einstein Imagine looking at the starry sky in the Stone Age, without smog, urban light pollution, and all other annoyances of modern civilization. There can be no doubt that human beings back then were intrigued by the stars in trying to comprehend the laws of the spectacle going on in the skies. In the early hunter-gatherer societies, observing natural phenomena led people to create the first mythologies. Already in ancient Egypt, the appearance of Sirius, which usually preceded the flooding of the Nile, was understood as the signal to start cultivating the fields. This is how we react as human beings. A continuous process of reasoning takes place in our mind, and we try to make sense of what we perceive, connecting facts that may or may not be casually related after all. Back then, it seemed more than obvious that what was going on in the skies was ruled by higher powers such as Ray, the solar deity. What other than a mighty deity could steer the course of the inaccessible stars? Later, the ancient Greeks began to identify the wanderers in the starry sky called planets and described divine qualities to them. These systematic observations were nothing other than an early form of scientific research. However, at any period in history, science has had its respective limits on comprehension, beyond which lay unknown territory. In the ancient cultures, some phenomena were called gods because they could not be explained otherwise. Yet the parallels to modern science are quite obvious. The assumption that it was not just the whim of individual gods that governed planetary motion but rather profound laws may be seen as an early attempt to create a unified theory of the universe, something that physicists dream of to this day. As time went by, people paid more and more attention to planetary motions and recorded them accurately. Yet, despite the idea of a single almighty God, astronomy was forced to attribute a series of characteristics to the individual planets until the Middle Ages. All orbits were assumed to be precise circles around the Earth, but in order to account for the apparent retrograde motion of some of the planets that indeed hinted at the Sun being the center of their orbits, additional assumptions for their orbits were invoked, so-called epicycles, that is, smaller circles mounted on their larger relatives. As observations became still more accurate, the above description turned out to be insufficient again prompting the postulation of other workarounds such as the eccentric, a quality that denoted how far the circle on top of the circle had shifted its original center. Of course, all these assumptions were far from intellectually satisfying, but for the lack of any better explanation, astronomers reluctantly accepted the existence of such arbitrary quantities. God made numbers beyond the limit of human understanding. In his monograph, Big Bang, Simon Singh comments on the epicycles as follows. Every flawed model can be saved by such fiddling around with numbers. However, we shall not be tempted to disregard these early forms of science. After all, the geocentric worldview back then was by no means stupid or even far-fetched. Observing the sky was already a great achievement in itself. It has to be complemented by looking for deeper theoretical reasons, yet this search is not always in lockstep with observational progress. The geocentric picture that dominated astronomy until the Middle Ages was retrospectively seen as a deadlock, because instead of providing explanations, the model indulged in a description by arbitrary numbers. God-given parameters with which the Almighty seemingly had endowed the planets and their orbits. This increasing complexity, so the antidote goes, was once commented on in the following terms by King Alfonso El Sabio of Castile. 
If the Lord Almighty had consulted me before embarking creation thus, I should have recommended something simpler. On the other hand, not to overly question the limits of current knowledge seems to be deeply rooted in the nature of Homo sapiens, gods, God-given numbers, whatever cannot be explained here and now, are readily declared to be part of the unfathomable. Note that it was the scientific elite who used to postulate such absolute limits of knowledge, unconsciously perhaps, because conceding that one's wisdom is insufficient is something uncomfortable to face. Consequently, recognizing the merits of the Ptolemaic worldview is necessary for a proper historical apprehension of science, though a dramatic leap of understanding occurred when the Copernican revolution unfolded. Copernicus intuitively understood that the Sun, not the Earth, was the center of planetary orbits, a point of view that immediately simplified the maddeningly complicated picture of motions. Based on Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe's precise measurements, Johannes Kepler eventually realized that the orbits around the Sun were ellipses rather than circles, a spectacular insight that all of a sudden revealed the essential role of mathematics in the laws of nature. The Book of Nature is written in mathematical language, as Galileo Galilei famously phrased it after having contributed to the breakthrough of the heliocentric model with his newly developed telescope. It was then Isaac Newton's turn to complete the revolution with an elaborately constructed system of both mathematical methods and physical concepts that led to an understanding of planetary motion on a highly advanced intellectual level. Inspired by the visionary idea of celestial and earthly motion having the same origin, he was able to prove that the planets followed the course of Kepler's elliptical orbits exactly, a triumph of the human mind that is certainly unparalleled to this day and marked the beginning of modern natural science. Let us take a closer look at the crucial elements of this scientific revolution. Frequently mentioned, yet a minor point, is that Kepler's ellipses describe the orbits more precisely than the old Ptolemaic system. More importantly, the prominent role of mathematics in the laws of nature had become evident and led to a unification of earthly and celestial gravity, an unprecedented insight that deeply satisfied the human desire for understanding. The long-lasting search for causes that presumably had started with primitive hypothesis in the Stone Age had culminated in a beautiful way. Methodologically, however, the decisive aspect is that revolutionary breakthroughs always go along with a simplification of the theory. That is why in Newton's theory, fewer arbitrary assumptions and unexplained parameters are needed. Indeed, just one, namely the gravitational constant G named after him, Big G. The latest measurements determine it as 6.67, times 10 to the minus 11 cubic meters per second squared kilograms. 300 years later in his treatise The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, philosopher Thomas Kuhn brilliantly showed the interplay of surprising new data, anomalies, and the increasingly complicated models invoked to describe them. The more sophistication and the more ad hoc assumptions such models use, the more unstable they become, eventually collapsing into something much simpler, which is intuitively recognized as the better model. In the old geocentric system, ignorance was disguised by dozens of seemingly God-given numbers. During the revolution, they became obsolete and were replaced by a single parameter, the gravitational constant G. The epistemological progress is close at hand. Dramatically fewer arbitrary assumptions had to be made about nature. Newton had, so to speak, sent a good many gods or God-given numbers into retirement and replaced them with a monotheistic concept, the gravitational constant as we know from history, to the utter displeasure of the real clergy. Henceforth, cardinals and archbishops lost their status as intellectual leaders of humankind and had to cede it to those whom we call scientists today. The history of science shows it is not the names that matter, but the function in the system. Scientists today act as the world's enlighteners, just like the medieval theologians what used to be called God, we now call laws of nature. The numbers that show up in these laws today are called constants of nature, or even fundamental constants. But epistemologically, they differ very little from the God-given parameters of the epicycle model. There are still limits to our knowledge. 
modern physics formulates its laws using a variety of constants of nature, about 20 in cosmology and even more in particle physics, that are not justified by deeper reasons. Since they cannot be explained by our scientific elite, they are considered inexplicable. Needless to say, these parameters present a much higher level of knowledge and the many planetary gods, simply because there are fewer of them, not to mention the degree of mathematical abstraction required to distill them from observation. But at the end of the day, the transition from gods to fundamental constants represents only gradual progress. We believe in constants of nature because they have resisted all our efforts to explain them. We neither understand their numerical values nor do we know the reason for their sheer existence. Their enigmatic connection to the universe gives them an almost mystical meaning. But let us be clear, constants of nature are the gods of modernity. That means, however, that if we want to make any progress by describing nature in a rational manner, we have to get rid of them. This is not a philosophical whim of mine, but rather the only consistent interpretation of the history of science. There is historical evidence that revolutionary insights have always been accompanied by simplification in the sense of reducing the number of free parameters. Just one key example, a striking consequence of Maxwell's equations of 1864 was that electric and magnetic fields could propagate in empty space without any electric charges nearby. It was probably the German physicist Wilhelm Weber who had the visionary idea that light could be an electromagnetic wave a bold speculation that was spectacularly confirmed by Heinrich Hertz in 1888. However, the revolution is already contained in the simple formula. Epsilon zero mu zero equals one over C squared, which reduces the number of constants of nature by one. Instead of three independent constants, C, epsilon zero and mu zero, only two are left. Few breakthroughs have had such a lasting impact on civilization as this one. However, there remains a lot to be done. Many constants are not explained yet. Take for instance the mysterious numerical value h being Planck's constant, c the speed of light, the so-called fine structure constant, another pure number of unknown origin. e squared divided by 2hc epsilon zero approximately equals one over 137th. Richard Feynman commented on it as follows. It's one of the greatest damn mysteries of physics a magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man. You might say the hand of God wrote that number and we don't know how he pushed his pencil. We know what kind of a dance to do experimentally to measure this number very accurately, but we don't know what kind of dance to do on the computer to make this number come out without putting it in secretly. All good theoretical physicists put this number up on their wall and worry about it. Nowadays, it's often argued that 137.035999 is just valid in our universe and there is an infinite number of parallel universes with different fine structure constants. I think this is a bogus explanation. Unlike most contemporary physicists, I am convinced that constants of nature in general do not represent an absolute limit to our knowledge, but mark our currently still limited understanding. Ultimately, these constants of nature are arbitrary, unexplained numbers that have allowed academics to find peace of mind by declaring the unexplained to be unexplainable. We should consider an alternative. The alleged existence of fundamental constants simply means that we have not yet understood the laws of nature down to their origin. Therefore, a rational description of nature cannot tolerate fundamental constants. Gods, whatever we call them, have no place in reality. A modified part of chapter one of my book, The Mathematical Reality, Why Space and Time Are an Illusion.